Please do, Brandon. So we're going to go on YouTube now, Marie. Okay. Okay, we're officially live. Oh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to May 17, 2022, Community Board One meeting. Our first item is uh, Queens Bridge Baby Park Reconstruction Project, New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Who will be doing the presentation, please? Uh, I will, will be Frank Vero from. Parks. Okay, Frank, welcome. Please go ahead. Can I get screen sharing? Yes, we're going to do screen sharing right now. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Be good. Go ahead, Frank. Try. All right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening. My name is Frank Farrow. I'm with New York City Parks, and I'm here to talk about Queensbridge Baby Park reconstruction. We have a $6 million budget of mayoral funds. The site we're looking at tonight is just over a third of an acre of the three acre total park. So the goals are to continue the efforts to improve the park and return it segment by segment to public residential use, and to activate the Vernon Boulevard side to provide a gateway between Baby Park and Queensbridge Park. Uh, it's located just in the shadow of Queensbridge itself. Uh, it's right on the edge of the coastal flood zone. Uh, and while there is some uh, nuisance flooding in moderate to extreme storms, uh, along Vernon Boulevard due to the utility constraints we have on site, which you'll see shortly, as well as the grading, we can't really do anything to mitigate that with this project. The land use around it is a mix of everything from industrial down to residential, but obviously the most impactful uh, adjacent land use is Queensbridge houses to the east. Uh, as I mentioned, this is basically the far eastern edge, sorry, western edge of Queensbridge Baby Park, uh, right across Vernon Boulevard from Queensbridge Park and along the Queensbridge Park Greenway. So this is the site we're actually talking about tonight. Uh, it's currently a New York City Parks maintenance yard. It's bounded by, again, Vernon Boulevard, Queensbridge Park Greenway with uh, Queensbridge houses just beyond it. And then to the Southeast is uh, currently parks uh, facilities, and to the southwest underneath the bridge is currently the composting site, which is where the uh, maintenance yard that's on this site currently will shift to. Um, so this is basically what the utility impacts look once you look underground. We have everything from the R train going under the site to a water main and a gas main. So basically the red areas are areas we can't really put footings or in some places even super permanent structures. So that impacts what we can do in this design a little bit. Uh, there are a few existing trees on the site up along the greenway. This is looking right from underneath those trees to the east. You can see the greenway with the bridge over on the, the right. Queens Ridge houses are off to the left. This is looking from the corner of Vernon Boulevard and the Greenway with that maintenance yard right in front of us. And then under the bridge, you can see the compost site as well with the Greenway off on the far left edge. This is looking from Ber Vernon Boulevard into the site. And then this is just one of the views I wanted to highlight really quickly looking back towards the west. Um, where you get some really nice views of Queens, Queensbridge Park, but also some great views of the bridge, including this one straight through the middle of the site where you get the Empire State Building kind of perfectly framed through the archways of the bridge. <clears throat> so in the, uh, we had a visioning session a year 
ago. And then back in February, we had a community input meeting. We heard a lot of different really good ideas. Uh, we did hear, you know, some about people who want to continue composting where it was or even expand the composting into this area. Um, but from the really immediately local residents, we mostly heard two things. One was a request to bring in play structures so that kids could really use it and turn it back into a baby park, which as I noted with the utilities, there's really not room where we can put enough footings to build any really substantial play area, unfortunately. So the other thing we heard a lot about that what we really focused on was requests for seating tables and gathering places to really be able to make a place where community can really form and be strengthened, uh, even through small events. So that's what we really ran with in this design. So we have two entrances into the new park, one off Vernon Boulevard over on the left and one off the Greenway through essentially a new crosswalk to get across the bike lanes as safely as possible. Then you come down into this large circular area that is ringed by benches with companion uh, ADA seating and a drinking fountain. And that really serves for individual seating if you wanna come and maybe take advantage of that view of the Empire State Building actually goes straight through the middle of this circle. But also this would be a good space if you want to do you know, if someone wants to organize an impromptu yoga class or something out in the park, they could do that. Um, then out to the sides, we have two smaller gathering spaces with uh, tables and chairs. That's flanked by shrubs to really help frame those spaces. Uh, some trees for a little bit of shade in that late summer where you actually get out from the shadow of the bridge to provide some respite. Um, and then that's also ringed by turf so that people could sit on the lawn, have a picnic, play catch, that type of thing. Um, and then we also have high screening shrubs, both to the bottom of the screen and the right of the screen to screen that new maintenance yard and those existing parks facilities. Um, we'd have chain link fence to keep people out of those facilities in the maintenance yard. And then we'd have our normal four foot steel fence uh, framing the rest of the site across Vernon and across into the bikeway uh, to really make sure that that access is controlled and as safe as possible. We'd be using uh, nor our kind of normal selection of uh, parks furnishings. And we focused on a planting plan that really provides a lot of bright white flowers and some pinks and purples for some nice continuity in the actual landscape as well. And that is the design. And thank you so much, Frank. I'm going to open it up for any questions. Um, first from the uh, box committee chairs. Uh, Rose, I'm sorry. I can't see if you're here. Katie, are you here? I'm here. Okay. So if you want to lead off with any questions you may have. Um, I, I wanted to start and see if any of the committee members had questions. Uh, this is the first time I'm seeing this also. I know that um, but this is also the first time I'm seeing this. So if any uh, parks committee members have questions. I would prefer to let them go first or Kathleen, if you have questions and then I'll collect my thoughts and ask them. Okay, thank you. Kathleen, thank you. do you have any questions? Yes, I mean, we've uh, this almost seems like part two of the discussion we had about the big compost. And I'm wondering, um, have they been given a site somewhere near there so people can still compost or are, is, did they have someone here tonight who could talk about that? Because I think the park's a very good thing, but I also think the compost was a very good thing. Frank, can you answer that question? Um, I, I believe a site has been selected where the compost would be being moved to. I'm not sure where it is off the top of my head. I don't know if anyone from Parks Planning was able to attend tonight who might know that. 
Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Um, obviously, we support more um, equitable park space distributed throughout our community, especially on night shift property. Um, but Big has been operating there for a long time and has revitalized the space under the bridge in many ways. And it would be really beneficial to know where their new space is going to be. And that would be that should be part of this presentation. Sure, very much understood. And Frank, are you, are you able to get an answer to the new location? Um, I can certainly look into it. Yeah. So, so this is Diane. I'm the yeah. design Diane. director. Um, we we don't know at Capital, you know, all of those particular things. You know, we're directed to do design work on a site, so. Um, we have to speak to, you know, I guess the community board has to talk to the planning department to find out what the status of what's happening with the, um, the big reuse. You know. Yeah, I think it is important, though, that because these are sort of related and both are about outdoor activities for our area that uh, we find out and get follow up as to okay. what's going where. So I, I would recommend reaching out to uh, Commissioner Dockett. Florence, you could probably do that or who, and um, I'm sure he will be able to answer that. Unfortunately, Capital does not know that answer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is Shirley. Um, I will look into it and follow up. I do believe that they were uh, big reuse will, was going to be moved to a sanitation space. I don't have the exact address. I'll follow up and then I'll get back um, to Florence with an answer tomorrow. Thank, okay, you, thank, you. thank you, thank you Shirley. Thank you, Shirley. You're, you're always there with the good answers. You're welcome. Yes, she is indeed. Does anyone else on the Parks Committee or any other board member have a question? I see Diana has a question. Mm -hmm. This is Rich. Oh. Uh, excuse me, Diana, do you have a question? Sorry, please? yes. I just want to make sure that I'm <clears throat> understanding that this is open space and seating, nothing more. Because I remember we had a whole visioning session where a lot of people gave a lot of ideas, but none of that seems to be here aside from seating. <clears throat> Um, yeah, the the use we're able to do, especially with those utilities, um, is primarily seating, open space, gathering area type space. Okay, and as a follow up, is this seating going to be uh, shaded? Because that would be a lovely addition to any park in Astoria. I feel like a lot of times you have all these tables and benches, but then if it's so hot, it's, you know, people can't sit there. Right, we um, we don't have any shade structure type thing going in. Again, with the utilities, we actually are pretty constrained in where we can plant trees. Um, no, I meant even like tables with actual, you know, some kind of structure that families could sit and have a meal and be covered from the sun. Right, and, and even that is actually a little bit tricky to do because most of the times those require foundations. Um, but part of it is also most of the year, this spot is actually so close to the bridge that it's actually in the shadow of the bridge. Um, especially in late afternoon, it's actually more early morning where it can kind of hook around because the site is, you know, twisted slightly. Um, and we do have, you know, there's a little bit of shade for these upper, um, the upper couple tables over on the right and for the couple benches in the northern, what the upper right, again, of the circle, I guess, uh, by those three existing London plane trees are up along the, uh, greenway. And then we have those, uh, understory trees down on the south for when it is later in the year for the month or so that the bridge shadow really disappears for a little while. Thank you. Evie Hedzapoulos? Yeah, I have a, a few comments. I mean, I do want to emphasize the fact that Big Reuse, that composting facility, is the one that is here in Queens. I believe the new site is going to be in Greenpoint, which means that we don't have a facility to process 
compost at the level we do. And at this point, the city should be building out more composting infrastructure. Right now, we're just moving something to another place. And I think it's important in the context of not just this park, but also like this community, because the more we're trucking food scraps and material to be composted along the roads, I mean, that is not good for climate change. It's not good for air quality. Um, you know, I feel like it's a serious, serious issue. Um, so that is a concern and I don't know why another spot can't be found for the maintenance facility. So much money was put in by the city to build the big reuse site. And now all that money, our tax dollars, you know, is gonna go to waste when, when that facility is moved. I think it's great to have, you know, restore the baby park here. Um, and so that's really important. Um, and I think there needs to be a better plan for parks to actually move um, the maintenance, not the composting site. Um, because I'm sure maybe the neighborhood would like the fact that there's actually a composting site there instead of just a place where trucks are parking, um, you know, and, and that's happening. Um, so I just really wanna emphasize that we should be building out more composting infrastructure as opposed to just keeping the same and moving it around. And like, again, Queens will not have big reuse. Um, in terms of this park, um, you know, I guess maybe there's limitations with the trees. Trees absorb, you know, greenhouse gases. Um, it's actually really important. I don't know if you can add more trees. I'm not sure if these plants are native plants. We, sh you know, I don't know how much consideration was given into that in terms of biodiversity and some of those issues. So um, I, I would like to know, um, are you using kind of native? You, it, it just flashed across the screen so quickly. Are these native? What kind of maintenance will they require? Are they going to be helpful in terms of biodiversity and food sources for, for birds and all that kind of stuff? That's my other question. Sure, we, we generally try to use natives when we can, uh, but we also really go by the idea of right plant, right place. So there's actually some of the things where, you know, these trees really kind of need to be understory trees because they are in the shadow of the bridge so long that you can't put a tree that needs a lot of sun. Um, and so for the site, there's dogwoods that would be uh, very good, but the native dogwood actually has a problem with, um, uh, I'm blanking on which disease it is, but there's, a problem with the local dogwood, dogwoods being susceptible to that. So this is an adaptive, non-native, but non-invasive dogwood that is not susceptible to that disease. So it actually requires fewer inputs, essentially, than using the native wood. And, and can I just, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead, continue. No, I was gonna say, and that's kind of what we try to do with all our plant selection is if we can't do a native, because of a reason like that, we try and find something that will fill that niche in a way ideally better than the native could, because there are actually times where that's kind of how those lock together. And, and for the maintenance lot, can you just describe to me what is going to go there? Is for, it the same exact kind of, you know, you're just kind of moving it? Oh, where the maintenance yard is going? Where um, it's not like now, you, is it basically gonna be the same thing just in a different location? I am not sure. That's that's more on the borough uh, maintenance and operations and planning end of things. I mean, will there be more trucks there or fewer trucks or? Yeah, I have. I... Hi, Vivi, this is Shirley again. So it, it would be my sector's um, maintenance lot that will be moving over to the big reuse location. It'll currently be the containers that we have um, there along with the gators, our garbage trucks, pickup trucks, vans. and So it'll be what you see there, um, as well as we get deliveries of mulch and wood chips that we use throughout the uh, throughout a story in Long Island City in our parks and playgrounds. That's what's being moved over to where Big Reels is at currently. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. My pleasure. Okay, Corinne Wood Haynes. Corinne, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Go ahead, please. Um, my question is in reference to the um, I 
And can you hear me? Yes, we go can ahead, now, please. Yeah. Sorry. My question was regarding the input. I'm not sure what was said that was given from Queensbridge residents. I am a resident of Queensbridge Houses. And um, I personally was not on any of the communication that you said started about a year ago. We were in the pandemic. I don't know, I don't remember seeing any flyers. I did speak to one of my um, neighbors, residents who was in on the meeting. He said there were about eight residents from Queensbridge there. There were two meetings and eight residents for a development that has 6,637 units is not an equitable buy-in or feedback or response. So I'm just a little concerned with the fact that um, there wasn't, I don't know if there was an adequate outreach done to get more responses from the residents. We have now in our development, five basketball courts and six playgrounds. And we don't have a dog walk at all. Like there is a nice one down on 40, a little bit past 45th Road. I'm just, like I said, wondering what efforts were done since it was during the pandemic. And I know a lot of us were struggling with the whole virtual um, process and participation. We, okay. didn't have an, we didn't have an existing association president since 2019, late, eight, nine, late 18, mm -hmm. early 19. So how was information disseminated to us? And you could just fill me in, you know, with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't remember exactly how the outreach was done for the two meetings, unfortunately. Um, I know normally we do put flyers up. I'm not sure of, I think, planning and partnership for parks normally handles that, right, Diane? Yeah, yeah. We've had two meetings here at this site. And yes, one was in the middle of uh, the pandemic that was done by uh, the planning department who has reached out to the uh, association in the, uh, the building there, um, as well as the community board. But we also had another one this past January where there were several people from the community who were there in, from the housing that was there. there. Yes, there was a lot of people from other areas about um, big reuse, but we focused on the people who were there from the community. Um, how that is being done, it's, it's been, it gets disseminated by your councilman, your community board, and the borough partnerships for parks and planning does that. Um, they, they reach out as best they can. And we, we okay. hope for the best. And Eileen is here. Eileen, yes, Marsh. I, I, Eileen, would you like to speak on this issue? I'm going to open the mic for Eileen now. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. Take half a moment. Eileen, open your mic. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead, please. Hi, hi, Ms. Haynes. Yes, it, you know, it, it was challenging um, not having a, a Queensbridge Houses Resident Association president for the last meeting. Um, I understand that you guys were, you know, in the midst of a, of a re-election um, and we're so excited to work with you now. Um, we did work uh, with NYCHA resident engagement to try to get the word out as best we could. So we worked with them um, to try to get flyers out in all of the buildings. Um, we worked to get flyers in the community center, and then we had, um, email blasts sent out. Um, so we, we did really try to get as many Queensbridge residents to the, the February input meeting as possible. And I'm, I'm so happy that you're here tonight to, uh, to give us more feedback. Thank you. And Corinne, I would also say, if you have a suggestion for a dog walk or anything else, uh, in Queensbridge, uh, why don't you forward that uh, to the chairs of the uh, Parks Committee 
and they'll take that up for our budget hearings. I just say at the at the last meeting, people did talk about the dog run, a dog run here. It was brought up, but the consensus was people were more concerned of all of the salts and matters that will be coming off the bridge would be uh, detrimental to the, the, to the dogs and their feet and their paws. So that was at that meeting was decided that this was not a proper location for a dog run. We did talk about it going on the other far side where the bridge kind of goes the opposite way, <laughs> goes away from the, the baby bridge park. So, you know, as as we further develop it, maybe it could happen down that way. Certainly, I'm only suggesting that Corinne, as the Queens Bridge a leader of the Tenant Association, might forward some of their ideas currently. To, mm -hmm. to the Parks Committee. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Corinne, for bringing that up. Thank you. Antonella Di Severio. Oh, thank you. Um, just a question. Was the site checked for contamination? And if so, what were the results? Um, I believe they are going out tomorrow to do the actual soil testing. So we're still, oh. we're still in the process of that. Huh. Okay, so I guess depending on what you find, that will determine cleanup efforts and uh, how you proceed with this project, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. But, and we did, you know, this design is uh, keeping in mind the site and the fact that it's right next to a large bridge and that there's obviously a fair amount of infrastructure underneath it. So we were fairly cognizant of the, the strong potential for contamination. Great, thank you. Thank you. Richard Guzami? Yes, a couple questions here. By the way, I make a comment on that. It, the contamination was a huge issue uh, when they reconstructed the seawall underneath the, uh, uh, the bridge there. It was a huge issue for years, so I have the feeling that it's gonna continue to be an issue. Um, and another comment on the discussion about the dog run. Um, you know, Parks Department built a dog run under the Triborough Bridge and it didn't seem to be an issue then. So I just want to make that comment. Um, questions for you. In terms of the tables, uh, will they, any of these tables be game tables? And uh, is there a thought towards tables like ping pong tables, something that can activate the place a little more, chess tables, um, uh, checkers, that kind of thing? That's the first question. The second question is <clears throat> lighting. Uh, being so close to Queensbridge houses, will the lighting be on timers? Um, will there be any chance of it disturbing the sleep of the tenants in the, in the association down there? Uh, and in general, what would the lighting consist of? Sure. Um, so first, yeah. in terms of, in this plan, all the tables are the, uh, this kind of, bistro style seating table, not game tables. Um, part of that is because where the tables are going, we can't put anything with footings and the game tables are big enough and heavy enough that they actually need a footing. Um, then in terms of the lighting, um, currently it's again planned for the, the same lights that are actually along the greenway, that same, um, like these same, uh, I think they're mm -hmm. probably 12 foot pedestrian lights. Um, I believe the way they're, they would be on uh, a light sensor to control them. Um, and there's one additional at the main entry up on the greenway. And then we have one at the entrance from Vernon Boulevard. Then there's uh, basically four one on each side of each of the um, small side spaces and kind of flanking that central space. Okay, they're not going to be on timers. They're going to be going to, um, all through the, the dark. Uh, no, right? I believe I believe they either, I think they each have a, um, a light sensor on them. So once it gets dark enough, they auto shut off. Or, yeah, all through dark, oh, they'll be running. Yeah, um, okay. yeah I believe so. 
Yeah, it's it's far. We have to light our parks for security reasons, Richard. Mm-hmm. But they also do have um, what they call the dark sky reflectors. So everything is reflected down, not reflected mm-hmm. up and out. So that is, and and they will be LED, and so that makes it um, more doable. Mm-hmm. This is a standard by DOT that, uh, and they're the mm-hmm. ones who provide the actual light and the service to it. Mm-hmm. Thank All right. You. Well, I would be great if you could just uh, rethink a little bit about the gaming tables and activate this place a little bit more. Um, I just we can look you know, into the bistros tables <clears throat> having yeah, um, that, uh, a, a, a game table on top of it. That's we can I mean, look into yes. that to see if we can accommodate that. Yes. OK, so these the, tab- the bistro tables won't be fixed. Then they're going to be movable. No, they're fixed. They're um, they are fixed. Yeah, they're attached but, yeah, but to the you concrete. Could, but you couldn't fix a, a game table or a ping pong table. Uh, I'm not sure about a ping pong table, but the the game the traditional game tables are actually so top heavy mm-hmm. that you couldn't plate mount them. These are actually you can actually see in this. There's just a a steel plate where they're mounted to the concrete, okay. so that they don't need to do a footing since we can't put the footings. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mitch Waxman. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is uh, based around, you know, other parks facilities have hours of operation, usually dawn to dusk, uh, where a parks employee will show up and close a gate. Is that going to be the situation here? And the second question I have is, do you anticipate reaching out to your colleagues at DOT to discuss uh, some changes to the street crossing uh, that neighbors the new park facility. Shirley, can you answer the first one? Regarding the closure of the site? Right. Um, yeah, we do not have the means to close the site. That would have to be an enforcement thing. And that would be something that the borough commissioner would have to approve. Um, if you know, And normally that's under consideration if there is or have been like series of safety concerns that take place, but normally we don't lock up sites. So that would indicate this is a 24 hour park. No, no. park is 24 hours. Do we do usually close by 10? It's just, we don't have the means to lock up a site. We don't have the manpower for that. A lot of our sites, even playgrounds don't have gates that we will close, but they do have signs stating that the site is closed by 10 PM. Okay. Um... Uh, and uh, on the subject of, uh, like I said, I would just ask you to reach out to your colleagues at DOT and um, uh, this, because if we're going to be bringing large numbers of people, particularly kids and elderly people uh, crossing Vernon um, from the old park to the new park, we're definitely going to want to uh, talk about that intersection a little bit. It's a dangerous high volume arterial road. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay, we can. You. We always have to reach out to all of our sister agencies for any of the work that we do. So we will be reaching out to them. Thank you, Yuma. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, <clears throat> on a similar note, um, the uh, the greenway adjacent to the park uh, is sometimes uh, a really great uh, and safe protected uh, bikeway, uh, but uh, oftentimes you will see a lot many cars parking are uh, on it, uh, driving on it. And as we're thinking about, you know, making the access points very friendly and attractive for pedestrians and bikers uh, alike, I would like to um, echo uh, the last uh, comment and, and see if we can somehow uh, work with DOT or, or other partners to to really protect and, and fortify uh, these access points so that they are friendly for uh, all ages and, and, and all people. Thank you. Rod Townsend. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in looking at this, and I, if I heard you right, there's a $6 million budget for this. We've seen a lot of programs throughout the years and that just for what you're describing here the six million dollars seems a bit outsized can you give me some of the major 
uh, dollar amounts that are going into this? Um, what's, what's really consuming this budget? Thank you. With the, the design that you see here, we will not be fully consuming this budget. Um, this, the budget is for the entire Baby Queens Bridge, and we're only focusing right now on this area. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is Jim Matuzas. I just wanted to add to what Diane said is that um, we also don't have our, our um, uh, soil testing back yet. So we're, that's still pending. And, um, you know, in order to remediate soils, um, we're going to need some money there too. So we don't have that number right now, but, you know, we do have enough and we feel confident that we'll be able to um, treat anything when uh, we get the results back. Thank you. Uh, Katie Elman, would you like to speak now or ask your questions now? Yeah, sorry, I'm in the middle of eating dinner, so forgive I'm me sorry. for a second. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, I want to thank the design team for coming before us and sharing this. Unfortunately, um, I, I'm disappointed in the design and um, based on the constraints that you have shared, that's understandable, but for a site that's been inactive in you know, a formal way, um, as far as the city's concerned for so long, I will echo other comments from my colleagues in that it just seems, it seems disappointing that there should be more, that you know, more um, consideration of other views, especially the people that live adjacent to the site. Um, should have been considered. A handful of community members is not an adequate representation. And I understand the limitations of parks in regards to convening groups of people, but that I am sorely disappointed in this. I'm sorely disappointed in the fact that big re reuse is being moved out of our district. Um, and I feel that unfortunately our community is losing more than it's getting. I would like uh, Kathleen to share any other thoughts or questions. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, I, we seem to have one more question from a board member. So Rose, Rosemary Yelton, do you have a question as well? I, I only wanted to echo what uh, Katie just said. So you guys we can't hear you, can you speak louder, please? Oh, no. Are you able to hear me? Uh, Bailey. Rosemary? Okay. Marie, may I ask another yes, question? For a moment. You, oh, sure. Yes, for Yes, I saw. Well, um, Rosemary is working sure, on her sure. audio. Go ahead. Uh, apologies. Um, if the soil turns up, I guess, what would the time frame be? So there's most likely contamination that needs to be remediated. What is the timeline and is there potential that, you know, this may not be built as a result? So can you answer that? Um, but Diane? I, I believe the timeline to find out should be fairly quickly. I I, I, well, I think we're going to be able to build what you see. We just have to mediate you know, the, the soil there. That's what we would have to do. So I think what you're seeing here, we designed it knowing that we had a really good chance of there being contamination here. And so that is, that's how we, we went about designing this project. So what you see, I think, is going to still be done um, after we get all of the soil testing back. Okay, and is there an estimated in past experience in doing this work in other locations? What does that look like time-wise? Because we know the construction timeline is usually like 18 months minimum. What would the remediation be like? It, it would be part of that construction timeline. That I think this would, I believe this is a one-year construction. So right now, like we're at we're about 30% done with the design process. So we have until next January to finish the design. It then goes into procurement, which is also another year, and then it will go into construction. 
okay, which will be another year. And so you won't see this be completed for about two and a half years from now, okay? Um, the mediation that will happen will be a part of the construction process. They will be, whoever is the contractor will be doing the necessary work associated with it because we will outline it in our contract documents. Right, Thank and you. it won't, it wouldn't add additional time to that. No, so that's the timeline. Thank you. Uh, Thank Rose, you. Mary, are you able to ask your question now? I hope so, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, I apologize about that. Um, so a couple of questions, or one question in particular, the water features for the park, are there two water fountains? Is that what I'm seeing? I apologize for- uh, It's one water fountain. There's one water. drinking fountain that's uh, two drinking fountains and a bottle filler. Okay. Um, so that, that's fantastic. I'm wondering how well that serves the young children that were hoping to use this park uh, and their mothers and fathers in particular or caregivers. Um, that's just, just something that I, I feel like there needs to be a little bit more consideration given that it is designed for younger children. Um, uh, Wait a second. The drinking fountain has two heights. The lower height is for ADA and for lower small children. Absolutely. There is also a bottle filler that you, as a uh, as a caregiver, can fill up a, a you know a water bottle, just you know like a water bottle. So definitely, definitely. I'm I'm more thinking of like um, being able to wash hands, um, that type of thing. Um, just to that make that's sanitary, and we can't do that for you. So I also, I just, I wanted to echo what uh, has been said with, uh, by Katie and Evie, like there's a lot of concerns that I have. I'm, I'm on the parks committee as well. Um, and there's just a lot of concerns that I have. Both have been stated uh, by these two in particular and, and more, um, but I do want to kind of second those, uh, those thoughts that uh, the compost facility is very much needed. And I, I, yeah, there's just some uh, feelings about the design that I think that we could do better with. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Chelsea Lopez. Hi, everyone. Um, looking at the other slide that you were mostly on, it looks like there's only one trash can towards one exit. Um, I'm not sure how often that's going to be picked up, but if there's going to be eight tables, I can imagine that filling up pretty quickly and why maybe there shouldn't be two garbage cans, one by each exit, um, just seems more convenient and also like it would keep the space clean. Right, I overall there's three, there's uh, okay. one down here kind of hidden, it's a little bit hidden by that tree. Uh, and then there's one over here kind of close to the drinking fountain as well as then one up here. So each space kind of has its own uh, trash can. Gotcha, makes sense, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Tyrone Gardner. Tyrone. Hello everyone, <clears throat> hello everyone, good, good evening. Um, I have a, a, a basic request. Um, what about putting a kitty exercise park in that area as well? So the, the trick with, if it's, if it's any sort of equipment, most of that type of exercise equipment, again, unfortunately, requires footings that there's not enough space to actually put those in to make that doable. That is something we've looked at trying to find a place to do, um, and it just wasn't feasible with all of the utilities below grade. And thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I see there were some raised hands, but I believe that's because they were not lowered uh, from previous questions. Uh, so if you could lower your hand, if you don't have a question now, thank you. Uh, uh, right, um, Katie, are you still on the call? Yes. Okay, so you'll um, bring this, um, to committee during the business section and discuss it there? Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, New York City Parks. 
Okay, thank, thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Uh, New York Power Authority, Lou Gordon or Wendy Frank, V Garden Clean Path and NY. Okay. Wendy. Hey, Madam Hi. Chair. Before this is Wendy Frank. I'm uh, passing the baton to my two uh, Clean Path team members, Frank and Luke Falk. Thank you. Madam Chair, one of the gentlemen has Wendy's name in front of him. There's a gentleman okay. with a white and blue shirt. Yes, I What's see What's your name, him. sir? Hi, That's everybody. Frank. I'm, I'm Frank DeFemia from NYPA Development. Okay, Frank, I'm going to change your name. Bear with me one moment, please. And then but we'll he wants this. to be Wendy Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, um, continue, please, Frank or Lou. Hello, Frank. You want to introduce yourself and set us up, and I'll take it from there. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Frank Defemi. I'm senior director of transmission development for NIPA, NIPA development. I'm here today with Luke Falk uh, from Energy Re and Gordy Gray from Invenergy to talk about one of our very interactive and interesting projects called Clean Path New York. And Luke, do you wanna take it away? Sure. So let me see if I can share uh, a PowerPoint, if that's okay. Can everybody see what I'm trying to show? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Luke Falk. I am uh, running the day-to-day -day development of the Clean Path Project for a company called Energy Re. Um, and uh, we're here to talk about what that project is all about and what it means to uh, your community. And so I first wanted to start by thanking you for giving us the opportunity to present tonight. Um, we're pretty early days in this project and I'll explain the timeline around the project and, and what it is that we're doing uh, and when things will be happening. Um, but I wanted to stipulate at the outset that it is pretty early on in our process um, but we wanted to get in front of the community board early to elicit your feedback and thoughts about what we're trying to do. Um, so let me try to advance the deck here. Um, so Frank introduced himself from the Power Authority. I'm sure everybody on the call is, is familiar with NIPA. Uh, they own a third of the bulk power system in the state and are the largest state-owned utility in the country. Uh, Invenergy uh, is with whom Gordy Gray is affiliated. And I'll give Gordy an opportunity to introduce himself and Invenergy before we move on. Thank you, Luke. Uh, my name is Gordy Gray. I'm a VP of uh, Transmission Development with Invenergy. Um, and we're... Um, the, the largest privately held uh, developer of renewable projects in uh, North America and have had a, a long history in New York with uh, decades of, of uh, development of wind and solar projects upstate and are excited to join uh, NIPA and Energy Re in, in the, the Clean Path project. Yeah, and so, um... I'm, my name again is Luke Falk. I'm with Energy Re. Energy Re is a clean energy development firm uh, started in New York City uh, by the principals of the related companies, which is a real estate developer local to the city. Um, and we have our roots in um, developing large, complicated infrastructure projects. Um, and so, Together with NIPA and Invenergy, we uh, are advancing this Clean Path New York project. And so what is the project? Um, just to give you the top line summary, um, it's a, well, 
actually. Let me start here before we get into what the project is. Um, in 2019, New York State it, uh, passed a piece of legislation called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It's a piece of climate law that seeks to um, bring New York State um, into alignment with uh, carbon targets that will help mitigate climate change in a meaningful way. Uh, and so central to the law is, are targets about the decarbonization of the state's electric sector. And so the state specifically wants 70% emissions-free power by 2030 and 100% emissions-free power by 2040. Um, along the same time horizon, New York City passed a local law called Local Law 97, which also seeks to regulate carbon emissions, but in a different way. It caps the emissions from buildings. Um, I only mention that because there's a little bit of a dovetail between the two pieces of legislation. But the main story is around how um, when the state passed the CLCPA, um, the regulatory apparatus um, needed to respond with a way to ensure that those targets could be met. And so um, the state issued a solicitation um, through the Office of Energy, which is called NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, of J in January of last year that sought projects um, that could help the state achieve its goals. And specifically in reference to, to the project that I'm talking about, the big problem that needed to be solved is the fact that upstate New York is already largely emissions free today. So like only 10% of upstate New York is powered by fossil fuel fired energy. But downstate, it's almost the exact opposite. Like a couple, like a couple of years ago, it was 70 something percent fossil fuel driven. And with the closing of Indian Point, it's closer to 85% fossil fuel at this point. Um, and so, the grid operator describes this as like a tale of two different grids. And so uh, the state sought projects that could help remediate this imbalance in the carbon intensity of the systems and develop a tremendous amount of renewable energy that could be deliverable into New York City. And that's where we come in with, uh, with our project Clean Path New York. So our solution to the problem um, is a bold vision to develop 3,800 megawatts of all renewable energy entirely located within the state of New York, a mix of wind and solar that I'll describe in greater detail uh, in, in the next slide or two. Um, but for the non-energy people in the room, that's really a tremendous amount of, of power capacity. And so in addition to building all of these new renewables all over the state, we're also going to build 175 mile all underground or underwater transmission line that connects Delhi and the Western Catskills um, down into New York City so that the power that we're generating can be deliverable um, into the city. Because like I said before, we have this bifurcated grid where some of it is clean upstate and it's dirtier downstate. And our new transmission line is going to be the solution that helps solve that problem of congestion on the grid that's preventing power from flowing from here to there. So when we do it, um, the generation side of the project is a seven and a half billion dollar project. The transmission side is a three and a half billion dollar project. Um, our partnership is advancing all of the capital to build the project at the outset. Um, so we're making an 11, roughly an 11 billion dollar investment um, to build both the generation and the transmission. Um, we think that it is, as far as we know, the largest single investment in clean energy infrastructure in the history of the country, um, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, because everything that we're doing is located within the state, 
Uh, we create 8,300 jobs along the way, all of which are located within the state of New York. Um, when we bring this much power online all at once, um, even though most of it is going to be delivered into New York City, uh, there, are, there is some of it that's going to be delivered elsewhere across the state, and we can get into that if you want to later. Um, but even though most of it is being delivered into the city, it has like a cascading ripple effect across the state's electric system, um, whereby we're reducing the amount of fossil fuel fired generation across the entire state by 22% per year on average when the project comes online. Uh, you know, just for better granularity and focus on the city issue, um, we're, we anticipate that our project will power roughly 15 to 16% of New York City's entire annual electric consumption every year. Uh, so it's a huge project. So when you do that um, and you supplant the fossil fuel fired energy with renewable energy, you wind up avoiding 49 million tons of carbon emissions by 2040, at which point the state believes that this, the electric system will be fully decarbonized. Um, and when you do that, um, you avoid emissions that plague frontline communities that host fossil fuel fire generation today, um, and so by avoiding those emissions, those community members um, experience better health outcomes. And so you basically uh, deliver billions of dollars in avoided social and public health expenses um, over the life of the project. So that's sort of the top line summary of what we're trying to do. Um, just to give you a sense of the timeline, I told you that we were sort of early days and how that works is, um, in January of last year, um, NYSERDA issued a solicitation calling for projects that could help solve this problem and fill this need. We responded in May of last year and were fortunate enough to be awarded um, the project by NYSERDA in September of last year. Subsequent to that, we executed a contract with the state um, that binds us to certain obligations, including developing the project by a certain date um, and delivering a certain amount of power every year, among other things. That contract was advanced to the Public Service Commission, which had the ultimate, that's the regulatory body that regulates energy and telecommunications across the state of New York. So our contract needed to be approved by the Public Service Commission which it was uh, last month on April 14th. So now we are in a position where uh, we have the opportunity to continue to advance the project, which we're going to do. And the next step in the process, um, there are a couple, but primarily, I think for the purpose of today's conversation, the focus should be on the next step being um, the Article 7 permitting process. So the state runs sort of a one-stop permitting um, experience for large transmission facilities like the one that we're developing. Um, and it's a long process um, that Gordy is going to speak to at the end of this presentation in some detail. But that's really the next step that we need to go through in order to get the project permitted and entitled to be developed. Um, so we talked about the emissions reductions and the carbon reduction that we're going to deliver. But again, a total reduction of 22% of the state's fossil fuel fire generation capacity uh, every year um, when we bring the project online and 49 million tons of carbon savings uh, by 2040. Um, this is a slide that describes the generation portfolio that we're developing. Like I said, everything is contained within the state of New York, um, but it really is distributed pretty evenly geographically across Western and upstate New York. Um, it's roughly evenly divided between wind and solar resources, which is good from a reliability perspective, because you don't want to rely 
too much on any one technology. Um, so we have an even split, roughly 2,000 megawatts of wind, 1,800 megawatts of solar. Um, other things to say about the portfolio, each of these generation projects is going to need to be permitted on its own, um, which is you know, a very rigorous study of all of the potential impacts of developing um, these renewable energy projects in the communities in which they're situated. 30% um, of them have already been permitted and are ready to be built. Uh, half of them have a NYSERDA contract of some kind already today, which indicates that they're very mature, even if they're not already permitted, uh, but will be very soon. Uh, about 60 to 70% of this portfolio will be developed directly by Invenergy, with whom Gordy Gray is associated, and, Inven and Energy Re, uh, who I work for in collaboration. Uh, and the rest of it will be developed by third parties um, who are advancing projects on their own, and we're just going to contract with them to use their power under our umbrella framework. Um, I don't know that there's anything else really to talk about on this slide. Um, oh, yes, there is one more point to make. So all of these are new and additional to the system. None of them exist today although a small handful of them have already broken ground um, and are starting to be constructed uh, even as we sit here today. Uh, but the good news is that this is a tremendous volume of new clean energy that's gonna be brought online across the state by virtue of our effort. Um, so let's talk about the transmission side of the project um, because it has, I think, the most direct bearing on issues that the community board would would be interested in. Um, so first, the premise of our strategy is that the transmission line should be all underground or underwater. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, but the primary reason is um, it's just a more resilient and uh, community-friendly way, we think, to develop transmission. Uh, so if you bury the infrastructure underground, it's less vulnerable to extreme weather events. Um, it's more hardened against climate change. Um, and uh, so let me describe to you how we get from the Western Catskills into New York. So we start in a town called Delhi, uh, where, so this is HVDC technology. So what is HVDC technology? It's high voltage direct current. The entire grid runs on alternating current or AC. So we're using HVDC, direct current, because it's a more efficient way of conveying a high volume of power over long distances with fewer line losses. It's sort of the state of the art in transmission technology today. So in order for the line to be able to work the way that it's intended, you need a converter station at the top and a converter station at the bottom. What do those converter stations do? They take the AC power from the grid and they convert it to DC power so that it can be sent down the line. And then when it's received in the Southern end, it's converted from DC power back into AC power so it can be injected into the grid. So at the top of the line, we have a converter station located um, you know, in Del High, right next to a substation owned by a utility called NYSEG, um, which is called the Fraser substation. Uh, and the reason that we chose it is because it is a location that is the closest to New York City, but it's on the opposite side of all of the congestion on the system. And so we place it there so that when we bring our power across the line of congestion, we're actually solving the problem of the tale of two grids. So we start in Delhi and immediately we enter a right of way called the Marcy South Corridor, which is a transmission corridor that is um, operated and maintained by NIPA. And so today, NIPA hosts overhead power lines in the Marcy South Corridor. We're going to take our line and just bury it underground in that same right-of-way 
because in it's, it's an existing right of way. Um, and we think that's the most environmentally friendly and the most community friendly way of locating a new piece of infrastructure uh, because it's already um, a, a corridor that's been used previously for the same purpose. So that brings us basically a hundred miles south all the way from Del High into Orange County at an area called Rock Tavern. And at that point, we leave NIPA's transmission corridor and we head east. Um, and for the rest of the line, uh, we're either buried in a state roadway, um, either in the roadway itself or on the shoulder or in a median, or buried in a river bed of some kind, or we're in a city street. And so now I'll explain to you how we do that. So from Rock Tavern, we head east in the median of I-84, which is a, a, a federal interstate, um, until we get to around the Newburgh area. Um, and at that point, we go into the Hudson River and start heading south through the riverbed of the Hudson all the way until we get to uh, Westchester. And uh, at that point, we want to get out of the Hudson River because uh, it's an area called Havistraw Bay, which is especially environmentally sensitive um, and, you know, a fishery uh, habitat area for, uh, for a lot of different fish species. So we get out of the Hudson and we proceed south 10 miles through Westchester um, in state roadways. Um, until we get around Ossining, let's say. And so we, at around Ossining, we hop back into the Hudson River, and then we head south in the Hudson until we meet the Harlem River, and we head east through the Harlem River. Um, and then we spend a very small amount of time in the very southernmost tip of the Bronx. Um, and then we get out of the Bronx, and into the East River, and we make our way into the Astoria Energy Complex, um, which I'm sure you're aware is an industrial parcel in the northern part of Astoria on the waterfront that's been um, dominated by energy infrastructure uses for quite some time. And that's where we're going to locate our southern converter station that allows our power to be converted from DC, DC power back to AC. From there, we run AC lines underground in city streets um, for approximately three to four miles to get from the Astoria Energy Complex into a substation owned by Con Ed called the Rainy Substation, which is right on the East River adjacent to the Ravenswood Generation Facility. The reason why we're coming into Queens is because the whole idea of our project is to reduce emissions um, in frontline communities. And although I spoke about carbon emissions at the outset of these remarks, I wanted to amplify the point that when we bring fossil fuel fired generation offline because we're bringing in clean energy, it's not just carbon that we're saving. We actually reduce from the electric sector overall in the state between 20 and 22% of criteria air pollutants, including nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, and particulate matter emissions, um, which really are the drivers of negative health outcomes for frontline communities. And so, the reason we're coming into Queens is because the closer you get to the heart of Con Ed's network, the more robust of an impact you have on supplanting fossil fuel fired generators in the city. Um, and so we thought it was especially important to try to get as close to the heart of Con Ed's system as you can. And the heart of the system is sort of like in Dumbo. Um, you can't really get to Dumbo. It's sort of a long conversation um, for transmission planning people, but the closest approximation that we could get to it um, was the Rainy substation, which is why um, we're having this conversation here today. Um, so 
Frank, would you like to explain BG and the role of BG in our project? Hi, everyone. Uh, NIPA has a facility that opened in 1973 in the Catskills called Blenheim Gilboa. It is a pumped hydro storage facility that acts like a giant battery. Essentially, there's two large pools of water, one at, at a higher elevation and one at a lower elevation, that during times when electricity is plentiful in the system, it charges the battery by pumping water upstream and it's retained in a reservoir at a higher elevation. And then when there's a need for electricity into the system, uh, we open the penstocks and the turbines and we generate off of that water that's then brought down to the lower reservoir. Um, this is done by the use of water. It's a renewable resource. And while this is an existing facility, the, the facility had some additionality um, in its current capacity. And we plan to utilize some of the additional megawatts that Luke spoke about earlier, the 3,800, as they come on the system, we plan to store some of that energy at the higher elevation. And then during times when it's needed in the system, we'll release that water and generate accordingly. Great. So, um, okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, yeah, so we have this giant water battery owned by NIPA so that, you know, when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, we're still going to keep the line full of power or as full of power as it can be. Um, so I have a couple more slides that I wanted to talk through. And then Gordy is going to talk about Article 7. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, on, in terms of the economic development element of the project, we talked about the fact that it's an $11 billion project. We talked about the fact that it creates 8,300 jobs. Uh, but two points that I wanted to make um, explicitly are that um, be, by virtue of our collaboration with NIPA, this really is a true public-private partnership. So the way that a NYSERDA contract typically works is that um, if a developer wants to develop a wind farm or a solar farm, um, they fund the development of the project, they get a contract with NYSERDA to help subsidize um, the facility and make it economic. At the end of that contract, the developer owns the wind farm outright and can do with it whatever they want. It's privately held. In our case, because we're partnering with NIPA, um, and because we believe in public-private partnerships, um, at the end of the first 25-year contract with NYSERDA, NIPA will assume full ownership of the entire transmission line um, in perpetuity so that it can be a publicly owned uh, piece of clean infrastructure to be used for the benefit of the state of New York. Um, a second point along those lines, like, I don't want anybody on this call to be under the impression that uh, a private set of developers is going to be making decisions around who gets power and when. We as developers have nothing to do with those decisions. There's an independent nonprofit called the New York Independent System Operator that will tell us when we should dispatch power using our transmission line. And their protocol for dispatch is all about optimizing utility rates for people who pay energy bills in New York State. And their whole mission in life is to reduce the cost of energy for ratepayers while keeping the lights on. And they're going to tell us when the, when the transmission line should be operating and we're just going to do what they tell us. So it's going to be a publicly owned resource um, and it's going to be publicly managed in the public interest. Um, the second thing is that um, we are pursuing project labor, labor agreements or PLAs with our friends in the union world um, so that all of the jobs that are directly enabled by our program are good paying with good benefits. Um, we think it's super important. 
Um, the final uh, discussion point, like I have two more slides, is that um, the CLCPA, the piece of legislation um, that governs like climate change response across the state, um, puts at its center um, the issue of environmental justice and the importance of mitigating burdens on frontline communities. And so the way that the law is written, they talk about these communities as disadvantaged communities. That's not the way that we prefer to talk about them, um, but it's the term of art in the law. So what the law says is that 40% of the benefit of spending on clean energy programs like ours should accrue to frontline communities. Um, and so, well, what does that mean? So we looked at it in two ways and we thought there's, there's a set of intrinsic benefits that emerge from our project, like the emissions reduction and the associated public and, and social health benefits. Uh, and then there's a series of investments that we make directly. Um, and collectively, those two elements um, form the benefit of spending on clean energy programs. So to talk about the direct investments, we're talking about things like um, our actual spending to develop and operate transmission and generation resources across the state uh, for 25 years. Uh, and then in support of that effort, um, those workers and, and those project participants need to buy goods and services to support that development and operations effort. And so we look at where those services are coming from and where they're going to. Um, and we overlay all of this on potential environmental justice maps um, from the state DEC. Um, and then we think about uh, a commitment that we've made to develop a community investment fund that I'll speak to on my next and last slide. Um, and we couple those investments with all of the intrinsic benefits of the project, of, of like cleaner air, the avoided social and public health expenses, the climate change mitigation benefits, the system hardening um, that we're delivering to the system, um, the electric system, by having this underground infrastructure to deliver power in a safe and secure manner. And we take all that together and we think we're extraordinarily well positioned to make good on the ambition of the law here and drive meaningful benefit into our frontline communities. Um, and so what is the community investment fund that I spoke to? It's a $270 million fund um, that's focused on four broad pillars of engagement. So one around workforce development and enabling um, the just transition to a new clean energy economy. So think things like um, apprenticeship programs, local hiring practices and the like, so that we can build pathways and linkages between frontline communities and projects like ours and our projects moving forward. Um, there's another set of initiatives around education, all things climate justice, energy literacy, um, preparing the next generation um, to anticipate and participate in where we think that the world is headed. Um, there's another initiative around expanding access to healthcare in frontline communities who we think for too long have borne the burdens of the fossil fuel economy. And then finally, an initiative around environmental stewardship, which in the more urban areas of the state, you know, we have a very broad geographic footprint with a lot of different um, types of communities along the way. But like in Queens, you can thank park rehabilitation and restoration. You can thank um, even initiatives to um, retrofit and electrify affordable housing, which has a whole set of associated um, community reinvestment opportunities uh, and workforce development opportunities in its own right, while it takes fossil fuel fired heating systems out of our built environment and further cleans our air. Um, so we think that this is going to be governed by a board of directors comprised of um, project participants like ourselves and community stakeholders who can help us um, figure out who should get funding for what purpose, to what degree, and what metrics we can use to measure the success of our engagement. Now, I'll stipulate 
everything that I've described is like pretty early days, right? This is sort of like me summarizing and finishing up before I hand it over to Gordy to talk about um, the permitting of the transmission line. But so the development of this fund is fairly early on. Um, and the development of our exact routing of the transmission line in Queens is pretty early on. Um, and so I don't have a lot of detailed maps to walk you through to explain how we get from Astoria to Rainey. Um, but I don't want you to take that to mean that we're not gonna share information with you. So we're engaged with the city, um, talking with DOT, with DEP and other agencies around how we can actually get from here to there in a way that benefits everybody the most and impacts everybody as little as possible. Um, and so um, what I can tell you is that there are only so many ways to get from Astoria to Rainey, if you're familiar with Astoria, um, we're studying all of the various alternative routings that could uh, allow us to do that. And we're working with relevant city agencies to figure out the best way to do it. Um, but before anybody asks, I will just um, offer up that we're happy to come back, um, we'll come back and talk to you about progress that we make along the way as we figure out with more granularity and certainty where exactly we're going to be and how exactly we plan on doing things. Um, but there's a huge dovetail in that conversation with what I think Gordy should talk about. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to him and I'll run the deck and you can just let me know when to flip the slides. All right. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, so yeah, we, we just wanted to walk you through uh, the Article 7 process uh, just to uh, uh, explain what, what the steps are that we're going to be going through over the next uh, several years to um, advance the process uh, and, and how uh, the community uh, can participate in the process. So um, uh, first up uh, in the, the next slide here, we, we have a, a flow chart. Um, it's actually published by the, the state uh, um, walking through the, the process that we'll be undertaking. Um, and, and Article 7 is, is the omnibus uh, permitting process that, that the state uh, administers for, for all major electric uh, transmission facilities, including Clean Path. Um, and so it, it, they break it down into four phases. We're uh, in, in the first phase, the pre-application phase here. Uh, there are two main activities that, that occur at this point in the process. Um, first, we're meeting with um, uh, both city, uh, you know, local municipal agencies, uh, state agencies, and federal agencies just to uh, conduct early consultation on the process and, and um, uh, help inform our, our development of the application um, and the studies that we're we're conducting that go into it. Um, uh, as well, we're uh, undertaking uh, a public involvement plan um, so that we make sure the community is aware of the project uh, throughout uh, the route. Um, so meetings like this are, are just one small part of, of the many things that are undertaken um, uh, as, as part of that uh, involvement plan. Um, and um, the next step in the process uh, uh, prior to actually submitting the application, uh, we will be publishing newspaper notices uh, um, in, in every um, jurisdiction through which we're, we're, uh, uh, the project is proposed uh, so that again, there's, there's a ample notification that the process is, is about to begin in, in the formal um, stage. Uh, and then once we file that application, we will be serving copies uh, uh, of, of the application uh, on, on every municipality um, uh, in which the, the project is proposed. There will be copies available 
in local repositories. Uh, it'll be posted on our website. There will be uh, many, many different ways um, that that the public can can have uh, can access the application. Um, the uh, Department of Public Service is the the state agency that leads the the review of the. The application, they will uh, review it for completeness uh, at that point uh, in, in the process. Um, once it's deemed complete, um, there will be a, a judge that the state assigns to administer the, the process um, uh, through the, the, the formal um, review. And uh, one of the first things that the, the, the judge will do is, is uh, schedule pre-hearing uh, conferences, but also public statement hearings um, throughout the, the route. Uh, and that will be uh, an opportunity for um, members of the public to um, uh, appear and, and um, make statements uh, about the project. Um, also at that point in the process, um, Anyone may intervene, uh, and actually, as soon as we file the application, any member of the public uh, can can intervene in the process, and, and we'll talk a little more about um, what that means and how that works um, in a few minutes. Um, uh, so after the, the public statement hearings that, that the state conducts, um, then the, the process goes through the, um, the, the legal uh, stage where uh, evidence is collected uh, from um, from the parties that are active in the case, and and then any issues, um, if there are issues to be uh, adjudicated, those those are um, those are done by the the administrative law judge. Um, uh, there's also a, a settlement process prior to that um, that that hearing process where we'll seek to try to resolve. Um, all issues uh, as, as uh, um, before before reaching uh, the the hearing stage, um, and then at the at the end of, of that of that process, then um, legal briefs are filed, and then the the public service commission makes its final decision um, on the on the project and and the certificate, um, and then it it will. Uh, attach conditions to to the certificate if it's issued in order to ensure that that the project um, meets all of the the rigorous environmental standards um, that that the state applies and and is um, developed and then constructed in in such a way to um, ensure that that the environmental impact of the project is is minimized uh, and that the public is is continued to be um, uh, you know, informed of everything that that is going on, and that um, that, that the the issues raised uh, by parties and and uh, um, and the public throughout the the process are are addressed um, throughout the construction and operation of the project. Um, and then the last stage is is post uh, certificate, uh, where um, detailed environmental management. Uh, uh, filings are uh, we will file those to the public service commission and and those plans will need to uh, meet the certificates or the conditions that that are applied to the project um, next slide and and so just to um, underscore the the review the and and stringent and strenuous um, and rigorous uh, process that's that's undertaken. Um, Article Seven is is really fundamentally a, an environmental review process um, uh, that uh, involves um, a host of of detailed environmental analyses that that we're um, in the process of of conducting and undertaking now. Things like wetland delineations, cultural surveys, um, consultation with um, more than a dozen agencies, as, as I had mentioned, um, all to inform and build a, a solid record um, to ensure that that impacts are are minimized and and uh, and avoided to the maximum extent practicable. Um, it is worth highlighting as as. Uh, Luke mentioned uh, as well that because the project is is fully underground and underwater, um, 
you know, that, that does um, reduce the impacts of the project, uh, particularly once, once the project is constructed, um, there, there would not be visible impact from the line. Um, and, and it really is the, the most um, impact minimizing um, way to develop a, a transmission project like this uh, for the long term. Um, and, and we are working toward uh, submittal of, of the Article 7 application this fall. And uh, last slide. Um, finally, want to um, underscore the, the opportunities for public uh, review, involvement, and participation in the process. Um, uh, those will include um, uh, attending public meetings uh, and, and open houses. We'll be conducting uh, an open house uh, campaign throughout the route um, uh, this summer, so that that will be an opportunity for for members of the project to uh, come and um, meet with members of of uh, the development team, ask questions, learn more about the project, um, you know, provide input, um, and um, uh, uh, really hear first firsthand about the project. Uh, as well, we're maintaining a a website, social media, and, and we'll respond to, to email questions um, uh, now and, and throughout the process uh, uh, that we're undertaking. And then um, lastly, wanted to, to touch again and in a little more detail on um, another opportunity for, for members of the public to participate in Article 7, which is actually to become an intervener in the process. Um, and um, and that enables, uh, as a as a party, enables the uh, anyone to contribute testimony or uh, and hire experts to contribute testimony. Um, and as part of the Article Seven um, application filing, we will also be submitting um, uh, uh, an intervener fund deposit for the state of uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, and that will be available to members of the public and municipalities to support the cost of, of their participation in the process. And um, important to note that uh, we won't play any role in, in the allocation of that funding. The, the judge that's appointed to the uh, proceeding will, will do that. And so um, there is uh, information about um, how to file those applications available on the the. Uh, state's website, uh, dps.ny.gov. And then as soon as we file our application and, and have uh, a case number, we'll, we'll have that information available as well, uh, specifically for, for how to intervene in our project. Um, so um, with that, uh, that, that um, concludes uh, the uh, presentation. Um, and, and walk through of, of the Article 7 process and uh, hand it back to Luke. Yeah, I mean, the last thing that I'll say is, uh, look, I mean, I encourage everybody who's interested in what we're trying to do here to check out our website, cleanpathny.com. Uh, I really do encourage anybody who has questions, who wants to get in touch with us directly to email us at info at cleanpathny.com. Uh, and also you should follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is uh, at cleanpathny. Um, we're pretty active, wanna hear from you. Uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, really having a productive engagement with all of the communities um, that we are gonna be working with throughout the process. So thank you for having us, um, you know, Obviously, I think we're going to open it up for Q&A, but I'll turn it back over to the chair uh, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Well, I have a question. Do you, you do not have, if I understood, a proposed route um, in our community where you will be going underground? Yeah, Is that's that right. Yeah, we're still in sort of the early stages of compiling um, what we think is a feasible and optimal routing in conjunction with, you know, multiple agencies. And, and, you know, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to come before you today um, 
so that we could elicit your feedback as to anything that you think that we should be aware of as we're developing our plans or, or any areas that you think are especially sensitive that or projects that are forthcoming um, that you want us to take into consideration as we you know, begin to finalize what we think we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. I see we have a lot of questions. So um, uh, before I turn it over to Mitch Waxman, who's the chair of the Transportation Committee, uh, Dan Alibody had a question from 10 minutes ago. So Dan, can you hear me, Dan? Yes, yeah, yeah, I, ahead, had, I had to un unmute myself. Uh, yeah, I have a two part question. Um, we are mainly concerned with the uh, portion of the transmission uh, system that's in our immediate area. However, I need, I'd need i like to know two background um, pieces of information. You mentioned the, in quote, uh, a battery of um, two pools of water um, acting as a battery. Um, I'd like to know uh, how many days of backup power w could that uh, potentially um, provide to our community? And the other part of the question is, um, you mentioned, a, you spoke a lot about the southern portion of this power transmission system, um, 100 miles down here. But there's another 250, at least 250 miles running north up into Canada, across the border. And I'd like to know up about that end, how will um, U.S.-Canadian um, relations affect our electricity here in Queens? Yeah, so let me let me take that in reverse order. So I think the bit about Canada is animated by confusing our project with another project. So there's another project out there called the Champlain Hudson Express that is getting hydropower from Canada. That is not our project. We have nothing to do with Canada. I couldn't tell you the first thing about US Canadian energy relations. Everything that we are building on the renewable energy side is fully contained within the state of New York. Um, so with that having been said, in terms of our big water battery that NIPA built in 1973, it's called the Blenheim Gilboa Pumped Storage Facility. And Frank can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it is approximately 1200 megawatts that can be discharged over the course of eight to 12 hours. Um, and so it's not a long duration storage facility. You know, it can't keep our line full of power for days. The way that we intend to use it is that when we're generating more power than our transmission line can deliver into the city, we'll fill it up. And then at certain hours when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, we will discharge it. But we're not conceiving of it as being like, a facility that can keep us energized for days on it. So it's more of a shot in the arm kind of kind of thing. But um, the other thing was, so if um, if the lines all the way up to Canada, where is this electricity originating? Yeah, the so our line that we're going to have here in Queens. Uh, yeah, just to clarify again, our line does not have anything to do with Canada. It does not go all the way up to Canada. It starts in Delhi in the Western Catskills, about 175 miles away from New York City. All of the renewable energy that is flowing into the line is built in various projects across the state of New York that are all sending their power through the New York grid to the top of our line in Delhi. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Antonella Di Severio. Oh, thank you. All right, so I'm really excited for the clean air. We need clean air, clean air in our area, definitely. But we just wanna make sure that we're not um, transferring one benefit for another for a negative. For example, we had a presentation that sounds similar to the Champlain project. Um, and they're laying cable down in our area on residential streets and uh, the cable emits I know the cables that are 
they go in reverse direction. So it cancels out the electro um, frequencies, but it doesn't cancel out or doesn't mitigate the magnetic frequencies. So I think if you would consider um, a, a shielding, uh, a magnetic uh, a shield so that the EMFs don't come out into either the basements that are being occupied in close proximity or uh, affecting the people that are traveling above on that path, that road path. Um, but I'm sure we're all going to go into this in more depth when you, you, when you have your presentations before the, the committees in the future. But I just want, I just wanted to plant that seed. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's a great call out. So what I can say about it is like, I'll, I think I'll make two points. Um, but we will certainly be back in front of you again to discuss it in greater detail when we have like the granular route that we're going to propose. Um, but just conceptually, there are two things that I point out. One is that there are several, there are a lot of you know, high voltage power lines running in the streets of New York all over the place today. And this is just going to be another similar instance of that happening. Um, but it's it's also a highly regulated matter, right? So as part of the Article 7 permitting process, the Department of Public Service and DPS enforce um, thresholds for EMF emittance under which all projects need to comply. And those uh, thresholds are reviewed by, you know, as part of the article, not only the Army Corps and DEC and DEP, but, you know, the Department of State and the Department of Public Service and the Public Service Commission. So, um, and these are like current, um, you know, up-to-date thresholds that um, are informed by science and research. Um, all of that having been said, we're going to be well below the thresholds by virtue of being underground. Um, our cable is already shielded in, in metal, um, you know, for a large majority of the run. It's encased in a concrete duct bank, it's buried underground. And with these electromagnetic fields, they dissipate at the cubed root of the, of the frequency, which is like a sort of snobby scientific way of saying that they dissipate very rapidly, like as you get further from the source of the EMF. Um, so I don't expect that you'll take our word for it because I wouldn't if I were you, uh, but what we will be doing is making public uh, the results of all of the technical analysis around this issue that'll be publicly accessible to everybody who's interested as part of the Article 7 pursuit. Thank you. Richie Guzami. Yes, uh, just a quick question. I wondered on the other side of this, the actual creation of the power, uh, are you running into much nimbyism in the upstate area? Because uh, I know that... Uh, while people do appreciate the clean energy, they just don't want it in their backyard. They don't want a solar farm. They don't want uh, their view restricted by a windmill. Um, and is this a situation where the state would step in and, and have eminent domain or anything like that? Or, or is the state at all involved in these uh, creation of the energy of the farms themselves? Look, I think, thank you. Um, I think that's a great question. Let me take that in reverse order. Nobody on our team, and I have never heard anybody on the state even attempt to suggest that anybody has any interest whatsoever in ever uttering the word eminent domain with respect to renewable energy. So I think that's a hard no, as far as I can tell. Um, that having been said, um, you know, like, I think that from what I understand, like nimbyism is a thing that exists. Um, I think that uh, we are going to endeavor to work collaboratively with our host communities to make sure that what we're trying to do benefits everybody. 
um, and it and you know our plans are favorably met. Um, Gordy, I don't know if you wanted to talk further about it, given Invenergy's experience in the space. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, I mean, working with with communities to develop uh, wind and solar projects is is our is our job, obviously, and 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 Invenergy's developed. Um, well over a hundred uh, wind and solar projects uh, across the country, and um, and so we're we're very um, experienced in in uh, managing and working with communities um, in order to um, uh, help everyone to see the the benefits uh, of of locating those projects um, and and hosting those projects. Uh, and so, you know, we we've, we take that experience into uh, into New York um, uh, more than anywhere, uh, and and have um, you know worked uh, with with all the communities to to ensure that that the projects are um, uh, permitted and and uh, addressing their issues through the. The Article 10 and, and Section 94C processes that are similar to Article 7 uh, through um, uh, for for the generation side, um, and so um, yes, there there are local uh, you know small groups uh, potentially of of, of NIMBY uh, 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 activity in the state, but uh, we find you know broad support and um, mm -hmm. ability to, you know, work with communities and, and, um, uh, and secure the permits that, um, that are needed for all the projects that we're, we're developing. Okay, just to be clear then, um, on all these uh, energy creation projects, they're privately run completely and the state's not involved in it. So the, the projects themselves are privately uh, run. Um, mm -hmm. And and as we talked about earlier, though we you know those projects are uh, bid into the the state grid system, and then um, the the New York ISO um, determines you know if and when they're they're allowed to to operate to ensure that the the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. New York grid uh, is is uh, is supplied at uh, as as we talked about at the at the minimum cost and uh, ensuring reliable supply for for uh, all users. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Andreas? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, presenters. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure I can speak for a lot of people here that are very excited, you know, for clean air, clean energy. I think um, these are important investment projects and in infrastructure and, um, you know, the long-term benefit, um, if done correctly, can, can definitely be a big plus to the community. So, um, you know, this question may be a little bit difficult to answer initially, just because, you know, as, as you um, have said, there's not necessarily a set proposal of where these lines would run. But, um, you know, if, for, for those that have been to a lot of these meetings, there's a lot of construction going on in Astoria, you know, a lot of um, zoning proposals, and with that comes a lot of construction. And, and with that, you know, there, there tends to be a disruption with people's day to day lives. You know, construction creates accessibility issues, difficulty for, you know, people who, um, you know, mobility wise um, for them to get around their community. So I, I guess um, I'm just wondering with, with projects like these, um, when the groundwork is done to actually embed the infrastructure, you know, underground, um, how does that typically look from a construction standpoint? Is it similar to what you would expect, you know, if Con Ed does work on your block? Um, because it's renewable, would it require more work, less work, time-wise, you know, that, that sort of a thing? Yeah, I mean, I'll let Gordy take it, but I think the summary answer is that it's a lot like the type of work that Con Ed does, and, and that's basically what you can expect, but Gordy can elaborate on the details. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, in-street in construction uh, and bearing utilities is something that's um, pretty routinely, uh, very routinely done, um, especially in uh, you know, 
cities like New York. Uh, and so fundamentally the process, the construction process that, that we're undertaking here um, looks, looks pretty much the same as that. Um, we'll, we'll be opening up um, a, a trench in the streets. We'll be putting in conduits. We'll be uh, encasing them in, in concrete uh, and then, then we'll be closing it back up. Uh, the, Power lines that we'll be pulling through will will have will will come arrive later and be pulled through, so we don't need to keep the streets open um, for the entire process. Um, and of course, you know, as any street construction project, we'd we'd be plating, um, uh, you know, when when the work's not not undertaken. So so I don't think uh, because it's you know nothing about um, its its renewable aspect would add uh, to the um, you know the means and methods of of constructing and um, utilities in in streets. Okay, thank you. But I think that that is a super important question. So thank you for asking that. Thank you, Mitch Waxman. Hi, I'm glad uh, to see that uh, people are working on making a carbon free future, and uh, anything we can do in that dimension is fantastic. Um, we received a presentation from people in a similar business to yours a few months ago. Um, they actually had drawn up a route uh, for us to look at and discuss. Um, I have a couple of questions. First off, in aggregate, how long uh, is the channel you're going to be cutting into Queens meant to travel? Uh, as in from the time it comes out of the water at the north end of Astoria to the point that it makes it to the rainy substation. Um, secondly, what do you anticipate the duration of the street construction project would be? Third, uh, and this is just some commentary that came out of the conversation about the last uh, trench proposal, uh, there was some concern uh, along Vernon Boulevard about putting in metal plates specifically at crosswalks uh, due to the fact that the metal plates freeze over during the winter and create obstacles for people in wheelchairs and baby carriages and so on. Uh, but as far as the two questions, how long is the aggregate trench going to be and how long do you think it will, the project will take for you to do the installation? Yeah, so thank you, uh, Mr. Waxman. Uh, let me take the first one. In aggregate, I think you're looking at about four miles in Queens um, end to end. Now, like that could be plus or minus like a uh, very little bit, um, but it's right around there. Um, with respect to the duration and the plating issue that you raised, I'm going to nominate my colleague, Frank Norcross, who's been sitting next to me for this uh, discussion to actually uh, step up to the mic because he is the head of more technical things in our office um, and can take you the rest of the way through your answer. I, I was going to warn you there was a guy behind you. Yeah. I mean, it was it would have been scary, um, but... Yeah. I invited them. It, it is threatening, sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for having us today. I really appreciate the ability to, to interact with the community and just solicit your feedback. So uh, first off, to, to come up with the, the distance. So uh, Luke's right, it's, it's four miles. About a mile of that is sitting inside the Astoria complex. Uh, so, you know, about three miles and outside of the complex. Uh, with respect to the timing of the construction uh, and how long um, the, the streets will be open, it will probably be proceeding on in a number of different spots. Um, the, you know, the, the amount of time that any one section of the street might be open is, is probably, you know, a, a period of uh, a few weeks, um, you know, so probably in the span of, you know, uh, a, a few weeks to uh, a month, something in, in that vicinity as it sort of works its way um, from the complex to the rainy substation. Um, as part of the routing, uh, thank you for calling out the, the, the manholes, right? We have, you know, approximately every half mile or so, a splice chamber that involves uh, a manhole. Uh, we are looking at the preliminary 
um, routing in addition to, you know, where we put the splice chamber uh, bolts. So, you know, we would be looking to avoid uh, crossings, crosswalks, that sort of area that would be um, troubling and, and impact uh, pedestrians in Queens. So um, that that is all sort of the, the work that we are currently undertaking as we work with New York City, uh, Queensboro uh, DOT and the DEP to figure out, you know, the best place to to route in order to make sure that it's technically viable while also limiting the impact on the local community. So. Thank you. Yes. Well, I look forward. I look forward to discussing the route with you at some future day. Thank As you. We. Likewise. Thank you all for the presentation. I'm, I'm sure you will be back, um, especially when you have the route uh, and be back to see us at that time. So if nobody else has any questions, any board members? So thank you again. No, thank you. thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Can I get, please get a motion to adopt the April 2022 minutes? Motion. I'll Excuse second me. it. Yes. Any corrections or opposition? And chairs report. I just want to remind everyone that next week we are having a local area public hearing on Innovation Queens. Wednesday, May 25th at 6.30. If you wish to register beforehand, you may email the board office or call them. If you cannot or prefer to, you may register on site the day or the night of the event. Now I'm going to just mention that as we all know, we're on high alert now. So I'm going to suggest very strongly that anyone who attends this meeting wear a mask. Just for your benefit and the benefit of everyone who does. Any questions on this item? Okay, thank you. Florence? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so good to see you here all again. This week, the mayor's office elevated the New York City COVID alert system to high. Please continue to take any personal precautions necessary. Our office received a survey from the controller's office on your opinion on Department of Sanitation Services, and you've been asked to participate. This is a very short survey, and we ask that you participate. It has been posted on Facebook and Twitter, and I posted in the chat. In addition, our office has just completed a massive mailing for Innovation Queens project and the full distribution has been sent out formally as of today. We are also promoting this on Facebook, Twitter and the press regularly. Our new representative from the Community Affairs Office, the mayor, has been extremely hands-on and we have visited areas within our district touring some of the troubled locations. Two of the major matters addressed were RV trailers within our district and the issue of complaints within the Dutch Kills Civic area. We have recently had an uptick in commercial parking by one vendor and we have not only reached out to the parent company, but we have also been working with truck enforcement to address this matter. We've been working closely with the Department of Transportation on road work complaints as of late we have seen an uptick in utility work being done post pandemic as individuals return in some cases to more stable work cycles. Please feel free to contact the office with any local matters that require attention. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mom. Our committee reports. Consumer Affairs, Gino Panagulia. Good evening, everyone. I hope all is well. Uh, if you can all please refer to your spreadsheet that Florence has sent uh, to all of us. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's 24 businesses on this spreadsheet. However, there is one business of note 
that has been brought to our attention as a quality of life issue. Uh, the business that I'm referring to is uh, known as the Late Night Cafe. And it's been brought to our attention that there have been 150 311 complaints, 144 of which have been noise complaints. Also, and of notable concern, is the amount of 911 calls that have been assessed to this business, which number at 76. This is a great drain on our police resources, and it is for that reason that we're moving to deny this liquor license for this business. So what I would like to move forward with is a motion to approve all license applications and renewals for all but one, notably the Late Night Cafe. Motion. We have a second. 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 Thank you, Rosemary. Any objection? Motion carries. Thank you, Dino. Thank you very much. Environmental Antonella. Hi, um, Dominic had to work late tonight, so he couldn't make the meeting. But I just wanted to give, we did receive a response from DEP regarding the water levels, the, the levels of the contaminants. Um, the first site, we have two sites in our area that was tested in 2021, and it was again tested in 2022. The first area was 41st Avenue and 21st Street, which had a level of 0.048. The second area was 34th Avenue and 24th Street, which had a 0.054 rate. The, the contaminant level, the threshold was 0.06. Um, so it's, it's pretty close. But I'm happy to say that in 2022, it was tested again in March at 41st Avenue and 21st Street, it was at 0.29 and at 24th Street and 34th Avenue is 0 0.028. Um, we have to discuss this further in our next meeting, but it's possible um, it was reduced because they started using uh, UV light to, to disinfect um, the water. Uh, they're still using chlorine, but not as much chlorine. Um, we, we have to look into it a little more, but I'm um, really happy to report that the levels have come, come down. Uh, and I think that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Land use and zoning. Ruth Bedevi on the Jerry Caliendo. Yes, I'm just going, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to follow up on the chair's report of the land use committee future public hearings before we, um, before the summer. Uh, first of all, uh, at the June, uh, June meeting, we will be hearing a rezoning for 4025 Crescent Street. Uh, this is a property owned by the Rosenwalk Group, which makes all of the um, uh, water tanks around the city. Um, they're requesting a rezoning to allow a mixed use building, uh, which will also allow them to continue um, testing operations for their, um, for their tanks. That was certified by city planning um, early May. So we will have a public hearing on that um, in June. June 21st is the next board meeting. Um, the second one, of course, is the Innovation Queens that um, we, as, as the chair has mentioned, it will be a local area hearing on the 25th, but there will also, it will also be continued to the June 21st um, meeting um, at which, uh, and we will be taking this up for recommendation, both of these will be taking it up for recommendations to the community board on June 1st. Um, we are having a presentation tomorrow evening by the Innovation Queens team. This is a presentation of the certified application. So, um, and, and after which we will um, discuss it on June 1st for recommendation. Um, that's my report. I, unless Jerry wants to talk about something else, I don't know if he's here. Um, that, that continued, that concludes my report. Thank you, Elizabeth. Parks and Recreation, Katie Elman. 
Hi, uh, before we get to the um, conversation about uh, Baby Queensbridge, can we just share a few events that are happening, Marie? Sure. Um, so um, I wanted to say congratulations and thanks to all community members that participated in participatory budgeting with uh, Tiffany Caban's office. And to say that, um, a capital project winner was street tree plantings throughout the dis district, which we all know are definitely needed. And uh, for uh, improvements to lighting in Astoria houses. And then congratulations to uh, the Connected Chef on their weekly farm stand at Astoria Heights Playground and 31st Avenue Open Street. Um, events that are coming up this weekend and before our next uh, full board meeting is the Shoreline Cleanup this Saturday, May 21st at 10 a.m. in Astoria Park. There'll also be uh, Movies Under the Stars on Friday, June 1st in Astoria Park, Spider-Man No Way Home, followed by a park beautification day the next day to clean up potential mess that um, patrons left uh, at the movie, June 4th at 10 a.m. to noon. Um, APAC, a story performing arts center, which is no longer in the district, but was for a very long time, has two new, two shows running. Um, your Negro tour guide is running through May 23rd and their next show will run um, from June 2nd to 26th called Buggy Baby. You can find out more at apacny.org. And then lastly, the Queens Rising Festival takes place throughout June and um, all over the borough, uh, most notably at QED and Astoria. And you can find out more at queensrising.nyc. So thank you for that. And now if Marie and Florence can advise, so we open the floor for discussion amongst board members. Is that correct? Well, uh, the Parks Committee hasn't discussed this previously. No. No. Uh, Okay, would you like to make a, a motion and open the floor up to discussion about this proposal, Katie? What, uh, Kathleen, would you like to make the motion? Certainly, I make the motion to open the floor for discussion about the baby park. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well. So start the discussion, Katie, you obviously had some issues with the uh, proposed project, so. Yeah. Um, Richard, uh, yes, I made my okay. feelings and thoughts about this pretty clear. Um, and I would love to hear from other members. Richard? Yeah. Um, I think this is all premature, quite frankly. I think that the contamination issue is huge. I know that during the uh, uh, mitigation, uh, when they redid the seawall underneath the bridge, they had to go way down, like uh, two or three feet or something, of removing soil. It was so bad. And that's one of the reasons that that whole project took so many years. So I think that they're being premature. I think that if, in fact, they do have to displace that much soil, I think that changes the game a lot. They're going to be able to map the utilities. I think the reason why now they don't want anything fixed on the ground is they want to be able to move something so they can get at the utilities underneath. But if it's properly mapped, I think that, uh, uh, you know, they can put uh, equipment, because you need to have the equipment more activated. Uh, you know, it's just basically a sitting area now, which is okay, but I think that um, so much more could be done. And I, I really think the design will change once they do the contamination study. Uh, that's, my, that's my feeling. Antonella? Thank you. I think um, you brought up a good point before. We really need to have the people who live in that immediate area give input and bring them back to the table and see what their thoughts are. I mean, obviously they, mm -hmm. they were asking for a dog run or they were asking for maybe something else. So we, we really need to get their input, especially if they live in the immediate area. That's all my, uh, that's my two cents. Effie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, question. Was it a park before? Wasn't it once a park? So yes, it was. It Yes. Um, yeah, it's been baby park forever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I imagine contamination was an issue then too, right? So I, I mean, obviously it needs to be decontaminated, but 
I think so I just wanted to say something about the outreach because I know that many of the folks from Queensbridge who did attend, they were in favor of keeping the composting facility there. And I think that there were times when they were shut down by parks, it wasn't really. And so today we just saw a very, very small piece of it. And I think it's also important that we look at the larger picture in terms of the plan. Um, and, you know, I already said it during the meeting, but I feel like you can't just ignore the fact that this composting facility is going to be moved and then the maintenance trucks are going to be moved to that section. So, I, I you know, I, I think it's problematic for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I would obviously want to see some kind of park there that benefits the Queensbridge um, community. Kevin? Thank you, Marie. I just want to echo my sentiments from earlier. And yes, it was a park. I grew up here. I was here for 60 years. And in elementary, when I was in, still in elementary school, that was a playground back there. Um, there, wasn't the, there wasn't a truck site and none of that was there. It was long from one end of the, from the handball park all the way down was playground area. Full monkey bars, seesaw, the whole nine. So at some point it was feasible for that. I just really wanna echo the fact that we haven't done our due diligence in getting a um, views from the residents in the development outside of the eight to 10 people that may have been there. So that's it. I don't wanna say anything else. I'm sure the um, design and plan and the intention is already in place, but if we're gonna talk about it, I think that we should create a uh, platform for it to be equitably discussed. Thank you, Kevin. Kathleen? Okay, yes, um, well, I commented earlier to Katie that um, I feel like we're seeing uh, what's basically a, a rising level of feeling over the last several months and particularly during the pandemic, which I've identified as people saying, I'm tired of getting this little bit of something rather than something that we feel we really need. We're getting a minimum of good things, you know, from the city and as handouts from developers. But in the area, I think that we're seeing more and more people coming to the community board, people saying to their council members and the borough president that we need stuff that goes and helps the people directly. And as our last commenter just mentioned, there has not really been an equitable chance to listen to what the people of the community <coughs> As for the big compost, which spent, I believe, a million dollars to get their site where it was, essentially, after many, many people worked very hard to bring forward how important this is, they kind of got a pat on the back and sent to Brooklyn. So I think that this is just like a symptom of people in positions of design, both in the city and in the commercial groups that they are not paying attention to the stuff that's coming directly from the people in the neighborhoods. So that's, that's both about this, the park where people immediately had many questions about what could go there, what was going there, and clearly had ideas of what they wanted to go there. I think that as a community board, we can continue to step up our efforts to bring the pressure on the people who fund these things and approve these things, because after all, it is coming off of our taxes and it's coming uh, into our neighborhoods, some of which people are going to have to move because things are being replaced. So that's sort of an overall kind of comment, but it is it reflects so many of the topics we have discussed in the last several months, particularly during the pandemic when people really needed help. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Kathleen. Mitch? Yeah, I just want to echo what uh, Corinne and Evie were saying. Uh, I, I want to hear a lot more from the people who are going to live directly adjacent to this. You know, it's um, 
odds are what's in the soil there are PCBs and lead levels. There used to be a uh, there used to be a terracotta plant across the street uh, over there. So the soil is probably contaminated along the lines of what they call urban standard, you know, where it has higher levels of, of heavy metals and PCBs and other insulating fluids in it. So they'll, they're going to scoop all that out, you know what I mean, and put in something new. But again, the question is the shape of this. I, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't feel confident uh, voting for this unless I had some sort of mandate from the people who live next door to it. You know what I mean? I, I really want to hear a lot more from uh, from Queensbridge as far as opinion on this. Thank you, Mitch. Rod Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, Corinne, welcome to the board. I'm so grateful to have your sense of history and knowledge of the area. And I think this board has needed a member uh, and more members from Queenbridge. So welcome and thank you. Um, I'm kind of echoing what other people said, you know, this is part of a larger comprehensive plan and they're giving us uh, uh, a baby feeding of it. And, um, you know, if there's going to be soil mitigation in that one little section, if this is a larger comprehensive plan, then the whole area is going to need soil mitigation most likely. I think they should be presenting us a large plan, not a spoon fed little dollop. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Jeffrey. Thanks, Marie. <clears throat> um, I just want to uh, mention real quick. Well, first off, I'll um, I'll say that I work for Parks. Um, I am on the Capital uh, team. So my colleagues uh, presented tonight. I'm on the Brooklyn Capital team. So I don't have any work in Queens specifically, um, but my colleagues were uh, presenting tonight. Um, I, I do want to. I do just want to mention. I know we heard a lot about um, community voices and and how um, how are, how you know is the community to be heard. I know this team uh, particularly. I, I I don't know the specific work that went out to get this advertised, but I do. I did see when this came up. I know that there was a small turnout at the event. I know that flyers went up. Um, I also know that. Um, we received uh, that team received surveys back as we typically do. They were reviewed. Many of them probably came from uh, the composting. I know that was a big focus of, uh, of the of the scope meeting. Um, so I just I just want to say that there it's like they they the team followed the capital process. I was at the uh, I was I was not involved in the meeting at all, um, but I did see the flyers that came out for it. Um, you know people. We, we have the process that we follow. We have the scoping meeting at the beginning of the project. And, um, you know, maybe it wasn't properly advertised and maybe there is some way to come back maybe through Corinne or maybe through the Queensbridge um, houses um, um, uh, board. Uh, maybe parks can reach back out to them and get feedback on this particular design. And I think programming is specifically what we're all talking about tonight. Um, having uh, maybe an issue with, um, you know, what, what is the space going to be? What can it be used for? Um, maybe we can, uh, maybe a more broad view needs to be looked at because I know that composting was here, um, but I don't think that composting is a particularly uh, great program for this area. It's right on the road. And I don't think, I don't think anybody is saying that particularly um, that composting needs to stay here. I think what we've heard is that compost needs to move somewhere else in our district. Um, and, I, and I sure hope that that can happen. But particularly for this project, I do not think that we should let it, um, um, you know, fog our view of the particular program that should be used at this site, because composting maintenance trucks is not the proper view or is not the proper program for a project at um, uh, such a, you know, right, right along Vernon Boulevard, right across the street from uh, Queensbridge Park, right next to the Greenway and right next to the uh, Queensbridge houses. So. Um, you know, if, if programming is the issue, I think, you know, we could, um, we could continue to push that and we can continue to, um, I say we as in, I'm talking to this uh, community board uh, member here, I think we can continue to push that and parks can continue or, or, or further reach out to um, um, the local residents because I know that there's been around already um, of that, but um, 
uh, maybe maybe another round can be done. Um, you know, I, I do want to say as um, in terms of the environmental impacts, typically that's done about this part of the um, of the uh, of, of a project. We typically do um, develop a plan at about the same time that we're analyzing um, what's underground. Um, typically, unless we know of contaminants, like we, I'm, I'm working on a project right now in Red Hook that um, we we knew. Um, the EPA was involved. Um, we had a consent order to clean it up for, for lead. Um, you know, we typically know about those big uh, contaminants prior, not saying that there wouldn't be one. Um, but the solutions, and for this site particularly, being that it's, um, being that we can't excavate much to begin with because of the utilities and the utility complex underground, um, there is um, opportunity to remove a layer of soil not deep and cap it with clean fill and pavement. So, you know, we're not necessarily, we're not building a building here. So we're not looking to excavate, um, you know, we're not going, you know, 10 feet for a foundation. It's simply, you know, we, we only have to excavate enough for foundations and being that here, foundations are not a big issue. Um, you know, it, it, it might turn out to be less of a problem than we're thinking. Um, as long as it's capped with clean fill, and as long as it's clapped, uh, capped with the hard pavement, depending on what they find, of course. So um, just throwing my two cents in there for that one. And I think that's all I have. Thanks, Marie. Thank you, Jeffrey. So Katie, if I may suggest that perhaps you wanna bring this back to committee uh, and voice, uh, maybe formulate a letter voicing all the concerns that everyone expressed tonight, including the outreach, uh, to Queensbridge and see what that brings. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I don't think we're in a position to vote on this right now. Okay, so we'll table it until um, you have your committee meeting and discuss everything and formulate a letter to Paul expressing our concerns. Yeah. Kathleen, anything else? I think that's a good suggestion and I look forward to us being able to sort of document uh, the kind of feedback we've gotten tonight. because I think we've had some very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, everyone. Um, transportation, Mitch, Mitch Waxman. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, the other night we received a, uh, meet a presentation from the MTA describing a capital project they're about to start in Queens Plaza which is gonna see them uh, working on the pedestrian, uh, the pedestrian bridges over Queen Plaza and uh, also installing elevators. Uh, this, uh, these elevators, of course, will be going upstairs to Queens Borough Plaza. Uh, this is going to create several outages in the new year on both the seven and the NW lines. Um, MTA is going to compensate for those outages by bringing in shuttle buses and uh, having agents on the uh, on the street. Uh, they're still fairly early in their process, but uh, it's definitely going to happen. Uh, we did request of them that they consider programming what's called a walking transfer into Queens Plaza, which is something we should be asking for anyway, which would allow you to go from, you know, you swipe in to say the seven train, you get to Queens Plaza, you walk down to the ground, you find the IR, the uh, INDR station, and then the Omni system would consider that a transfer. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, we should have had all along, uh, but they did say they were going to look into it and consider that. Uh, beyond that, uh, that's all we had at the Transportation Committee. Thank you, Mitch. Are there any elected officials or their representatives here who would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand. Um, okay, um, can we open uh, Oriana's mic? Can't hear you, Frank. I just need a moment now to switch from, from okay. panelists to attendees. Oriana.
It's not coming up on the screen. One moment. I'm going to have to go down manually. Right on to Daniel Alibody. Office name. Office Can I spell of, her name wrong? O-R? No, it's under Office of C.M. Tiffany. Well, that's Scott. why I put her name in. Mm -hmm. Okay, bear with me. Enter Dan Alberti. I'm still not seeing her on my end. Let me make the screen larger. I just allowed her to do it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm unmuted, so I just want to see if you all can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead, Oriana. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Um, I have ex really extremely exciting news uh, to discuss, which we've already touched on earlier tonight, which is the participatory budgeting results. Um, so just a quick recap um, for folks who aren't as familiar. Uh, the council member allocated from her discretionary funds a million dollars for physical infrastructure projects and $50,000 for discretionary expense programmatic funding. All of the projects that ended up on the ballot were submitted by community members and then voted on by community members. Um, so in terms of the winning projects, really quick, the winners for the capital and expense projects, uh, I'm just going to outline for both sides is there's 500,000 is going to install new lighting in Astoria House's parking lot to increase visibility and safety. 200,000 for electrical upgrades at IS-126. 275,000 for tech upgrades for D22 schools. And just to be more specific, that means new iPads and Chromebooks for PS-122, IS-235, IS-126. Um, and a couple of others. And then there was 150,000 for street tree planting throughout the district. Uh, and then we're gonna go to capital expense projects, the projects that won. We have 10,000 for a weekly farm stand, 18,000 for a basics of cooking series, 5,000 for pop-up art classes, and 20,000 for Astoria's first gender justice center. Um, I believe I already dropped in the chat, but if anyone has questions, there's more detail here. Um, and you can always email our office if you have further questions. Uh, we are also really excited to announce that we have this week on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, the council member, as well as some of her colleagues, are going to be hosting a town hall, a budget town hall, where she will be providing updates on the budget process give some top lines on what's in the mayor's executive budget and suggest ways to engage in the budget process in the final month and a half. Um, as always, a budget is a values document, so we definitely would love for you all to attend. Um, and I've just dropped in the chat the uh, bit.ly link to sign up. Uh, but you can you don't have to RSVP. If you uh, see that you have time that evening, feel free to just uh, jump into the Zoom chat using that bit.ly and you can come in. Uh, for our legislative updates, our legislative team has been hard at work researching and drafting bills uh, to improve the lives of folks here in the districts and across the city. Uh, they're currently working on with a speaker on a package of bills in response to the leaked Supreme Court opinion striking down Roe v. Wade. These bills would move through the committee that the council member chairs, which is women and gender equity. And if, lastly, if you have any legislative ideas, um, please send them our way. Uh, while we currently have a full legislative plate, uh, our whole team, especially our legislative director and the council member are, are always interested in ideas from constituents. So I'm just dropping our legislative, uh, the email to send if you have any thoughts on legislation that you wanna be seeing the council member introduce. And just lastly, if you would like to get more information, I'm going to add the mailing list sign up for our uh, mailing list. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Ariana. Catherine Zapata. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, can you speak up, please? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, please. 
Great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kat Zapata. I am the Transportation and Policy Liaison to the Queensboro President. Um, just some quick updates. Um, the first one being the Queen's Bus Redesign Plan. Our office is currently taking any feedback and suggestions from either advocacy groups or constituents. If you have a suggestion, a thought, a concern, please feel free to email us um, or um, give us a call. I'll leave my email and phone number. There are more chambers behind these walls. Um, the next, we have some office events. The first one being the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Celebration happening this Thursday, May 19th at 6 p.m. at Borough Hall. Um, in the atrium, vaccination record is required. Next, Monday, May 23rd, we'll be hosting a virtual Advancing Leaders through Collaboration Business Webinar at 12 p.m. And then on May 26th, the Thursday, we'll be having our monthly Queen's Job rec Recruitment Fair at Queensboro Hall. In the minutes, you'll receive the link to, a, um, to um, join either one of these events. Please feel free um, to contact their office if anything arises. And thank you all for having us. Thank you, Captain. Bava Salam. Bava. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, please. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Farah. I'm from Council Member Julie Lund's office. I um, wanted to provide a few updates. In the past few weeks, we have been going around distributing COVID tests to constituents, visiting people at parks. Um, and we have also been um, hosting quite a few events. So Last week, we had our citizenship event with CUNY Citizenship Now, where we had about 60 people come and apply for citizenship through the CUNY um, Citizenship Program. Uh, next week, we have NILAG coming into Little Bangladesh in Astoria, and they will be providing legal services, intakes, and um, consultations with community members in the area. Um, it's on 30th, uh, 30th Street and 36th Avenue. So if you're in the neighborhood, please feel free to stop by and let people know that the bus will be there. Um, we are also planning a Know Your Rights with Moya um, in the beginning of June. So any community member can come and learn about their uh, rights when they're uh, encountered by ICE. And then lastly, tomorrow we have an event with um, the New York City Department of Health, where we will be hosting a RAT Academy in training. And this is really beneficial for business owners and um, landlords and tenants and really anybody, um, because folks will get an idea of what to do when there are you know, there's been a lot of rats lately. So what they can do to assuage this. And this is especially helpful for um, landlords and small business owners. And then um, just a little bit on the legislation side, uh, the council member earlier in the month introduced three bills that she adopted from former council members Rosenthal and Kalos, who both served as chair of the contracts committee before her. Um, she introduced so the three bills that she introduced, Intro 299 would add an optional question to the passport questionnaire asking prospective city vendors to voluntarily disclose the gender and race of their directors and senior executives. Intro 300 would require the commissioner of investigation to appoint a special inspector to monitor the emergency procurement contracts entered into the city in response to COVID-19. And finally, intro 301 would apply a contractor in a city agency or, a or the council that are parties to a city contract valued in excess of $100,000 and would establish standards for conflicts of interest that may arise as a result of entering into contracts with these organizations. Um, if you have any questions, any concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. I will leave our district email and our district phone number in the chat. Um, and if you would like to sign up for a newsletter, I'll also include that in the chat box as well. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Fallon. Members of the public who would like to speak, please use the raise hand function. Mary Ann? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Minutes. Hi everybody, this is Miriam, is she her pronouns? I'm the founder of the Astoria Mutual Aid Network and a community organizer here in Astoria. I wanted to follow up with a request that was made of a community group called Dave's Lesbian Bar that has been hosting events throughout Astoria to collect and support the queer community here in Queens with the goal of opening a physical brick and mortar bar and venue mutual aid hub sometime in the next 12 months. Uh, as you may know, this group has been doing uh, pop-up events around Astoria to try to create visibility for the queer community and create community for this often overlooked group. As of yesterday at 5 p.m., we were made aware that it, there was a demand from this community board to collect 60 signatures from residents of the block where we've been applied for a special activities permit for this Saturday. After looking through the listing of residences actually active on that block, there are no more than 70 residences available currently registered with the city. And the request to get and secure 60 signatures by, from residents on that block before Saturday seems wholly unreasonable. It's my understanding from the lead organizers in this community that while there may have been feedback from residents issued to the community board, there has not been meaningful or good faith outreach to communicate and mitigate those concerns until this very last minute at for an event that has been published and has a lot of community support. 30 seconds. So I'm here to ask if there's an opportunity to bypass this request. It's on the 31st Avenue uh, down from the open street between 37th and 38th and requesting a bypass of this request for this uh, Saturday's event with an invitation to host a collaborative conversation about how programming can be better supported and supportive of the residents of that area going forward. Uh, uh, Mary Ann, can you clarify um, the location you're speaking about? Yes, it's on the 31st Avenue between 37th and 38th Streets in front the of the now closed associated supermarket. 37, 38. One block only. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you for your concern. We'll address this offline. Thank you. What would be the resolution for offline as this event is on Saturday? So how can I follow up accordingly? Send an email uh, to the board office. We will send and another email. We'll, thank you. Okay. Will you do that? I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Yes, we've been in touch with Florence already, who was the one who made the request okay. with regard to the signatures. We will send an email as well. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this in advance. Marua Rigi. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Two minutes. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, hope everyone having a good evening. My name is Marwa. I'm, I'm an outreach coordinator with the Civilian Complaint Review Board. For those of you who may not know, the CCRB is a city government agency that investigates police misconduct. Um, so with the, uh, you know, as an outreach coordinator, what I do is I give presentations, workshops, I do tabling events, resource fairs, and so on and so forth um, to educate the public on what is police misconduct, what the CCRB does, um, how do we investigate complaints and um, what your rights are when you stop by the police and lots of other really important information. Um, so with the weather getting warmer, I just wanted to um, let anyone in this uh, meeting know that um, if you are planning on having any upcoming events, resource fairs or block parties, anything where um, you want uh, city government agencies to attend and share free resources and free information, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, or if you have a program that you would like a presentation or workshop for, please reach out to me. Um, I can share my uh, contact information in the chat. I, I see that it only says that I could share it with hosts and panelists. Uh, but hopefully if someone could just share it in the chat um, so that everyone can see it uh, in case they need it. 
Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to uh, share at this time. Um, uh, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to bring up an item from the public? No, okay. Motion to adjourn, anyone? Motion to adjourn, Tom Ryan. Second. And Amy Hall seconds. Thank you, Amy. Have a good evening, everyone. What's up Thank you. It? Thank you for being sure, here. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good, night. good night, all. Good evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.